Hello and welcome to Public Health in Real Life, a channel that is dedicated to educating people on public health issues, inspiring the next generation of public health and global health leaders, as well as to celebrate unsung heroes in global health. And today's topic is on supply chain workforce professionalization. And speaking of leaders, we have a leader uh, from the global health and supply chain field today to speak with us, uh, Dominic Swinkels. Before that, I would like to just start with a little introduction about this topic. At the end of 2019, the world um, saw the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it was declared, of course, in the early 2020. Mm -hmm. As soon as that began, countries started to see uh, a supply chain strain like never before. Resiliency was tested. Before 2019, when, when I told people that I do supply chain, health supply chains, uh, usually I used to encounter stares and uh, you know, gazes on like, what is this field? But now people are starting to have increased appreciation of the health supply chain field. This is not only the case with the regular population, but also with governments academic institutions and other nonprofit organizations starting to realize the importance of health supply chain workforce as an essential workforce within their countries, within their populations. And there is being not only the increased awareness of within supply chain management, uh, but in order to get those essential products like PPEs, um, masks, gowns, gloves, essential medicines, it's important to make sure that there's standardization within the health supply chain workforce arena. And even though many organizations like the UNICEF, WHO, and other leading global health voices have been advocating for supply chain workforce uh, professionalization, that, a, that arena seems to have a setback now, an organization by name People That Deliver, is, uh, which is dedicated to promoting sustainable workforce excellence in health supply chain management, um, organizations like People That Deliver are starting to come up with bold initiatives and frameworks to support governments and other multilateral and bilateral organizations to standardize the field of health supply chain management and we'll be learning more about it today and at no with no further ado let me welcome dominic zwinkels to this conversation hello hi dominic dominic is the executive manager of people that deliver uh, Dominic is an international development professional with 23 years of experience in managing programs with focus on international supply chain management, livelihood, food security, and nutrition. Since 2016, Dominic has been responsible for the management and overall performance of people that deliver, which is a broad coalition of governments and international, regional, and national organizations to raise profiles of the health supply chain workforce mm -hmm. as a key strategy area of a health system. She has, prior to working at the uh, people that deliver, Dominic worked with JSI, uh, John Snow Inc., working in supply chain management programs focused on HIV AIDS. Uh, through her leadership, the organization procured life-saving management, uh, life-saving medicines and medical commodities to uh, HIV programs worldwide. So welcome to the program, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you. So I began the program with uh, some of the challenges that we are seeing with supply chain workforce. But could you uh, just begin with uh, additional challenges that you see? And we can just set the stage there and then we can move on to what are some solutions that are being proposed? Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, let me just say that I'm, I'm extremely happy to be here today. Um, you know, I have worked in the health supply chain management for the last 14 years. Um, you know, prior, like, I, like you said, prior to my current job, um, I worked on the HIV AIDS supply chain for John Snow International at the Partnership for Supply Chain Management. Um, I just want to say I was very proud of the work that we did that because we were able to bring down the cost of treatment as well as sort of strengthening in-country supply chains with that. When, uh, when we first started, there were, you know, 30, 30 million people were infected with HIV on the African continent, uh, but only 50,000 people had access to treatment. And by the time that project ended, we had, you know, 5.7 million people um, receiving direct life-saving antiretroviral uh, treatment. So just mm -hmm. wanted to put a plug in for that project. It was just amazing to work on. Um, now I've been uh, the executive manager of People That Deliver since 2016, you know, and every day I raise awareness around the importance of the health supply chain workforce. And I work with lots of like-minded organizations to ensure that we're building a talent pool of supply chain management professionals uh, globally, uh, regionally, locally. Um, and so uh, as far as your, your question about uh, the challenges, so first of all, you know, human resources for health is an important building block of the health system. Human resources um, are really the core of healthcare delivery systems and also the main determinant of quality. It has been recognized widely that human resource problems are a major obstacle in the attainment of health outcomes, as many of you know. And there's a shortage of competent and motivated staff in health services. Of course, this is the issue for human resources for health, so doctors, nurses, midwives, uh, et cetera. PTD, people that deliver for short, is focused on that intersection of HRH, human resources for health, and supply chain, in what we call human resources for supply chain management. The supply chain workforce you know, includes a variety of people who are dedicated to fulfilling uh, supply chain and logistic activities at both at the, or actually, uh, quadruple, uh, national, district, health facility, even lower levels. Um, and it includes key personnel who contribute only a portion of their time to supply chain functions. But all of these people are collectively tasked to ensure that, you know, where uh, appropriate commodity selection is happening, quantification and forecasting, procurement, storage, distribution, stock management, even the use of health products. So it's a long list of different types of roles and positions. Um, so yes, the health supply chain staff, they're not recognized as part of the essential workforce. Um, many low middle income countries lack a professionalized, professionalized supply chain occupational category. Um, this is often uh, because they're not formed via formal education or through civil service structures which of course means that qualifications demanded for these positions do not match the duties and responsibilities that are required. Um, I think on top of that, really, there's this, um, there's the WHO national health workforce accounts. And this, 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 um, these accounts do not include health supply chain roles. Yet, of course, we know that they contribute to improved health outcomes. Um, we think that data on health supply chain workers not, must be included if ministries of health are to ensure that human resources for health policies are informed uh, and provide you know, an accurate picture of the human resource landscape in country. Um, so those are you know, some of the issues. But part of that as well is that there's um, challenges, of course, with the insufficient number of adequately trained staff particularly logistics staff to manage the supply chains. There's uh, countries that uh, face significant gaps in technical capacity and knowledge among their existing supply chain staff. And the, this is of course due to a lack of it, just experience, formal training, you know, that there are no supply chain logistic degree programs yeah. or there's not even any in-service training. Um, you know, it's a complex, a very complex workforce. It's a very highly specialized workforce. 
uh, and it's and it's very necessary for the continuation as well as the expansion of health services and supplies. Um, you know, and we are seeing a lot of new investments being made in technologies, innovations, new drugs, IT systems. I mean, it's a long list. And we need to ensure that they're all trained and have the right skills. So there has to be sort of educational opportunities, uh, education as well as professional uh, opportunities that they're able to join a professional association, for instance. Um, so I think <laughs> it was a lot, but that's sort of all the sort of the challenges that we see. So, uh, Dominic, when you sp you speak with a lot of government officials globally, so mm -hmm. what, how do you assess the awareness among um, government officials before the pandemic and uh, after the pandemic? How how much has the pandemic had uh, uh, put a limelight on this issue? Yeah, so the pandemic has definitely magnified the supply chain and its workforce. Um, you know, I always knew that supply chain was important, but when last year in, in 2020, when uh, WHO uh, Director General Tedros, you know, started talking about <clears throat> COVID-19 in his briefings and that supply chain was extremely necessary, you know, it became even that more apparent. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really put an increasing pressure on supply chains it's even more important now to sort of prevent, detect, and respond to shortages. Um, and of course, uh, you know, in, in the early days, there was uh, a lot of restriction to movement of goods um, across the global supply chain. Yeah, as you know, the restrictions that were on, um, on product being moved through air and sea and land, of course. Um, and, um, you know, all too often, the supply chain workforce is, is not considered um, when decisions are being made, made to introduce new products, right? So with the COVID-19 vaccines coming out and, the, and also new treatments, there's need for, for specialized skills to ensure the, the quality, safety, and efficacy, uh, as well as the efficient procurement for, and supply and distribution, right, for, for these vaccines as well as new treatments. Um, so I think, uh, you know, government, uh, governments are, are highly aware of the uh, of the importance of supply chain, um, you know, <clears throat> as as you may have been uh, been reading and and uh, made aware through the media, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion around ensuring that manufacturing uh, is happening at regional levels now. Um, yeah. you know, the CDC in in Africa is being developed. They want to be they want to uh, have ownership of their own sort of production and manufacturing of vaccines. And so that also has implications on the supply chain um, and, and, you know, has implications on the workforce. Absolutely. And yeah. talking about the academic institutions, uh, you, you started by saying that there's not um, a clear path for people to uh, pursue uh, degrees within the health supply chain arena or uh, within the uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, doing proper certificates. Even if they do the certificates, it's, there's no clear path whether they will get a job within that particular uh, arena. So what, what, can you like um, expand on the, um, the ad hoc nature of the educational system? Of course, absolutely. Um, so there are, I would say, and I often talk about it, that there are two paths to professionalization. So first of all, there's um, professional development um, and the other one is uh, academic accreditation. So the professional development, you can gain accreditation, you know, through a variety of associations that exist as well as taking uh, technical short courses in supply chain management through a variety of training institutions. Um, you know, globally, there are a number of certifications that are recognized. Take, for yeah, instance, yeah. the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, you know, is a certification that registers you as a chartered procurement and supply professional globally. And it's also a qualification that enables you to move from one country to another. Um, you know, SIPS, for instance, has a variety of certificates that are linked to UNDP, and which offer UN staff and governments and NGOs specialized procurement training. Um, others are, for instance, APICS, which is based in the U.S., but it has um, a certified supply chain professional certificate, which is also now being offered in Africa. 
Um, and then there's CILT um, out of the UK. It has a sort of an international advanced diploma in logistics and transports. Um, and then, you know, take MIT, which has yeah, a yeah. micro master's program in supply chain management. And these are just a few. And yeah, you can yeah. get, you know, CPD points uh, with all of these and they let you progress in your career and take charge of your career. Um, and of course, there's, you know, in uh, Take, take in the Africa region, there's, um, for instance, the Center of Excellence in, in Rwanda that since 2017 has had a master's degree in health supply chain management and has now been able to produce uh, several cohorts um, of, um, of professionals that we're seeing, you know, being uh, flooded into uh, many national supply chain organizations. Um, on top of that, you know, there's, several registration bodies uh, that also register the credentials and accreditations of supply chain professionals. You know, take for instance, in Tanzania, there's the Procurement and Supplies Professionals and Technicians Board. Um, and that is sort of a mandatory registration of supply chain credentials. Um, you know, and each country like that has, 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 a, uh, has a board. But the one in Tanzania specifically sort of is mandatory. But in Ghana, you have the Chartered Institute of Supply Chain Management. Uganda has the Institute of Procurement Professionals. Um, Kenya um, has also a highly uh, uh, interactive one, uh, the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management. Malawi, you know, I mean, the, the list just goes on. Yeah. Um, but I like to, you know, talk about, for instance, the, the one in, in Tanzania, um, for instance, uh, has worked with sort of uh, an academic institution, Kuna Foundation, and okay. they've established a, a bachelor's degree at the University of Dar es Salaam, uh, which in turn then, when, when you get that degree, you know, it registers you with the Procurement Supplies Professionals and Technicians Board. And so after graduation, you're certified a supply chain management professional. So it's a great example and one that uh, other countries should look at and replicate. Right. Thank you for that, Dominic. And as you say, you know, there are some um, excellent programs that are out there when it comes to supply chain management. But the, the overall nature is uh, there, there are a lot of roving supply chain um, officers around the world. And uh, the, the problem that people face is that it is not like um, standardized. Like people, uh, each country has a different set of um, you know criteria to become a mm -hmm. supply chain professional and uh, each um, certificate the, the the amount of opportunities that are out there is only like uh, um, you know uh, discombobulating mm -hmm. rather than setting a clear path so can you talk a little bit about people that deliver and um, its work around the uh, professionalization framework of course uh, sure absolutely yeah of course um, so as we know, there's sort of a lack of professional status and performance for supply chain management professionals. Uh, for, sort, for too long, we have seen that supply chain workforce positions did not require supply chain qualifications, and we saw clinical staff fulfilling those roles. Um, we also saw a lot of short-term training, limited resources and incentives, and of course, uh, something that we all deal with, a uh, lots of staff rotation and migration. And that's because there's no global standards for health supply chain management professionals. Uh, we see that in many countries, there's just no difference between supply chain management professionals that look after medicines and lo that look after other commodities. And so that's why, um, you know, I was talking earlier about the professional associations. They fill that role of setting practice standards for professionals where registration or regulation does not exist. So people that deliver, uh, through people that live, we're hoping to change that, where the supply chain workforce has an elevated status and empowerment within the health system. And they have access to relative incentives and resources. Um, supply chain positions, we want to see supply chain positions in health institutions uh, that are defined and require personnel with relevant qualifications and experience. You know, we want to move away from no longer just only pharmacists who are already in short supply, managing pharmaceutical supply chains with little training. 
we want to see supply chain workers have career incentives, you know, a, a career a career ladder within um, the health supply chain management, sort of that stimulates their performance and satisfaction and retention. So yeah. looking back at all those issues before. Yeah. And we want to see, you know, these positions become attractive because of that formal status and appropriate career incentives, you know, leading really to developing a market of individuals who seek these qualifications. And so important in that are that national regional institutions you know, can provide these qualifications to meet the market demand if we see the demand increase. Um, and then, you know, national health institutions can then more easily fill these positions with qualified personnel. And so within the people that deliver, we've developed a uh, supply chain management professionalization framework is what we call it. And it's really the first time ever um, where we're laying a foundation for a career pathway in health supply chain management. And we're seeing, we're de we've developed uh, five levels of designations. So going from associate to practitioner, to specialist, professional, and then to a leader. And we see that this framework helps governments to define standards. Um, it helps institutions of learning, you know, the, the, teach, the, uh, the teaching um, and, uh, and uh, vocational teaching, uh, universities uh, and other uh, places of learning, you know, be able to define teaching. Um, sure employers to define competency needs and employees to be able to map their careers. And so let me just explain a bit. So the framework has a library of competencies and designations, and that's really at the core. Uh, and that meets both public and private sector needs. And around that competency framework, uh, we have a mapping of education for health supply chains. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a full resource with over 250 uh, courses uh, in supply chain management, both uh, professional and academic. Okay. And then aligned to that is a collection of roles and job descriptions for health supply chains. And so that's the very first resource ever that contains um, over 80 plus roles and job descriptions for a variety of, of different uh, health supply chain management positions. Um, and you know their their full on <laughs> job descriptions include KPIs and everything, um, and then we have a, an implementation approach. Okay. And that is really there to provide sort of clear guidance on how to begin the journey of change. Um, and we have this all on our, our current website. We actually our website is being modernized right now, and we're hoping that within the end of the month it'll be up and running, and it'll be easy to find all of our resources. Okay. Um, okay. But it's uh, it's all there, and um, um, yeah. So the website is uh, yeah. Uh, can you uh, give the web? Order? Yeah. So that's uh, www.peoplethatdeliver.com. Okay. And uh, through that, people uh, through the website, people can access information related to these courses as well, right? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, that whole mapping of education for health supply chains is okay. there. You can download it. Um, it's even in an Excel format, and it and includes all of the different courses. Um, okay. Correct. That is fantastic. So people um, out there who are uh, health supply chain professionals who want to uh, elevate their careers you can look at the website that dominic has given we'll also post this on our description uh, to access these courses to become competent with the skills that uh, the jobs require so um, dominic we spoke a little bit about um, the opportunities that health supply chain folks can uh, um, you know um, pursue but how about at the government's uh, governance level uh, how can government level uh, can you give me some examples rather mm -hmm. of com uh, organizations or governments that have implemented this framework yeah of course absolutely um so actually right now we uh, are very excited and we're working with rwanda it is the first country to implement the professionalization framework um, um, next country will be uh, Nigeria. Okay. Um, and of course, we're looking for more countries um, to support in this process. 
But um, so I can give you the example of Rwanda, um, and, it, and we're really excited that there's very there's a significant local ownership and engagement in the process. Okay. Um, it's sort of a very non-rigid and and continuous process that's being done in different phases. Um, what I omitted to say is that the implementation approach has a, a racetrack of five different phases. Okay. Um, and so Rwanda has gone through the first two phases, uh, okay. which commenced in Rwanda in 2020. Uh, and that started, of course, started off with raising awareness via advocacy. Okay. Um, and then in 2021, um, the advocacy and the buy-in led to the identification of sort of major key players to include. And so we've got uh, the Human Resource Health Department of the Ministry of Health as the sponsor, the Center of Excellence at the University of Rwanda as the in-country representative, and then um, the USAID Global Health Supply Chain Procurement and Supply Management Project is, is the coach in country. Okay. Um, and so together, these three have organized, had had organized a stakeholders analysis workshop earlier um, last month. Uh, okay. really with the objective of sort of raising more awareness, uh, uh, constituting and activating um, a task force team and to then start to initiate the phases of implementation approach. And so what came out of that is a, a project char charter, okay. which sets out the rules and the role, sorry, the roles and responsibilities of each of the different stakeholders. Um, and um, yeah, so the process has started. And we can see sort of what uh, what I find very interesting is that we can uh, see how we can connect organizations now that have the demands for supply chain professionals and then the institutions that are supplying these professionals in Rwanda. And, uh, and so to apply the best approach, um, the, the way this is moving forward in Rwanda is that it's going to be implemented in one organization at a time. So this is really, you know, it's really con con sorry, country uh, specific. Sure. Every country is going to be different, but here they they opted out to um, implement it in one organization at a time. So there is the new Rwanda Medical Store (RMS) <clears throat> where it's going to start. Then it'll move on to sort of the University of Rwanda, and then potentially. Um, the regulatory body uh, that either exists or, you know, is that the, there might be a need for the creation of such um, such a supply chain council, let's say. And so those five phases, so the number one is the advocacy piece, then number two is sort of defining the scope, and they've gone through those two phases. Um, and then there's uh, sort of three more phases. One is really, the next one is um, the Human Resource for Supply Chain Management Building Blocks. Um, and I can speak a little bit more about that. Then sure. the fourth one is, you know, how to improve on um, what's already put in place. And then the fifth one, of course, the implementation and monitoring. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, any government, they can start their process from in a phased approach and yeah. then as they go through this framework, they will come to understand how they can customize their approach towards not only increasing that, um, you know, the increasing the capacity within their workforce, uh, but also the policies that they need to drive to get towards um, uh, a healthy um, supply chain uh, mm -hmm. force within their countries. So you, right. you will talk a little bit about the building blocks. Uh, the first step uh, of the framework is advocacy. Second mm -hmm. is scope. So through that, the governments will have a better understanding of what the needs are, what the scope must be, and then they go to the HRS um, or human resources uh, uh, building blocks, right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, can you just elaborate a bit about the building blocks? Of course. Absolutely. So we look at... Um, aligning current in-country supply chain activities with the competency framework. Okay. Um, and then we agree on championing uh, a champion organization as the professional body. Um, and then really translating those supply chain management uh, processes to role, to the roles, and then, and, and then seeing an alignment of those roles to designations and career paths. So okay. really so looking at 
what are those very specific supply chain activities and processes in country, and then aligning those to the roles, um, designations, and career pathways. Um, and then sort of uh, defining gaps that are discovered in that alignment. Right. Um, and we do that by rolling out uh, sort of competency-based assessments and defining competency gaps. Okay. And we have, um, we have a, a diagnostic tool as well as a training needs analysis to do that. Um, and once you've gone through that step, then it's about defining sort of baseline metrics for individuals and their supply chain performance. Um, and then I, I can keep going if you'd like, but then you know, yeah, developing yeah. Um, a project plan for professionalization, which then includes designation, the education, even mentorship. Uh, creating a personal development plan, um, yeah. you know, then trying to quantify and plan organization-wide education and designation activities uh, will be really important for each organization. Um, linking professionalization with sort of the intended organizational performance yeah. uh, is going to be really important um, for each of the roles. Um, and really embedding professionalization into the DNA of the organization is what I'd, uh, I'd say is, is really important here. Um, and then sort of getting confirmed buy-in from the executives yeah. uh, with the required resources, right, to progress. This is definitely going to be need of, of human and financial resources here to push this forward. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of roll out an approved organizational capacity development plan. And then once that is in place, then really um, uh, integrating and creating formal structures to manage the ongoing professionalization. So there's a, there's a lot of steps in there, um, but they all build on each other. Sure. So this kind of a framework implementation, does it begin with a government taking initiative or does it, can it also begin with an international mm -hmm. nonprofit organization advocating for it in, in the uh, national structure? Of course, absolutely. Um, yeah, it can, it can be both. Um, we prefer that it was coming from the government themselves. Uh, but as you know, um, there's, you know, there is a global movement by donor agencies to yeah. start to their host governments to independently manage their own health supply chains. So that's very much happening right now. It's being driven by USAID, um, DFID, uh, the Global Fund, um, yeah. Gabby, even even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yeah. And they're really they're transforming supply chain investments to you know to accelerate the improvements in the performance and and national ownership and financing of these of these national health supply chains. Um, and so they play a really important role in sort of promoting the transfer of skills to in-country uh, counterparts and then establishing the, the systems and the mechanisms of which professionalization right. is very important to, to that agenda. Right. And right. so, um, you know, and when you look at um, the donor agencies and their respective strategies right now, um, right. you're right. seeing them all speak about professionalization. I mean, right. uh, uh, Gabi just created the, their new five-year strategy and professionalization is one of their pillars. Uh, okay. We're seeing okay. Global Fund is, has come out with a, a new supply chain roadmap um, where they're also very focused on, on capacity building. Uh, right. You know, we'll see USAID also with their, with their new next-gen projects. It's, uh, it's all about professionalization. And I know that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well have a new... Um, workforce development uh, strategy as well. So it's, uh, thankfully they're all moving in the same direction. Uh, but you know, going back to your question, it, it's really important yeah. that the governments are taking ownership and um, driving this, but right. uh, the donors can come in as coaches and, and to support the process. Yeah, but with the eventually, with the eventual handover, but that's the way this was created. Yeah. Yeah. And, and probably the implementing organization, those are like the nonprofit organizations that are implementing mm -hmm. programs in countries. Uh, just, uh, just to name a few, uh, like for example, let's say CARE or International Medical Corps or uh, 
these are like some leading uh, ngos that are working in the humanitarian and development um, arena they can then work with the donors plus the government agencies to drive um, that kind of professionalization further and try to bring that kind of staff strength within their own organization mm-hmm. that's right that's right i mean if you look at the, our coalition you know it's made up right now of uh, 27 organizations um from uh the donor agencies and aid agencies um to sort of implementing partners um where just recently added catholic relief services which have a yeah a supply chain a large supply chain um arm as well but you know others like hmm, MSH management sciences for health uh, we have IPHL on our coalition which is the international association of public health logisticians yeah, um yeah. and other sort of uh, you know the the academics MIT is there uh, empower school of health which are doing a lot yeah. of digital health supply chain management uh, courses um and so you know working with a with a lot of these uh, organizations um is really the way to go yeah and donnie could you also um in terms of the implementation and building the capacity in terms of the education do yeah. you see that also as a phased approach for example when we go to the field we see that capacity is a huge issue among staff so perhaps begin with increasing the knowledge about supply chain and and then go towards advanced it mm-hmm. technological capacity building would, would you see that as a phased approach for example let's say uh, a country they start with you know first giving their staff with uh, the basic supply chain skills and then they implement programs towards increasing number of data analysts data engineers data scientists so that they can these the countries low and middle income countries can be self sustainable rather than you know depending on other um outside um foreign talent mm-hmm. oh yeah absolutely it's very much a phase approach it's really different uh country to country and at what um level of maturity um it's at yeah. um you know i would say rwanda is quite quite far they have implemented a lot of uh, different um health supply chain management um interventions and are already at that level where they understand that in order to it, in order to um have a a strong and efficient health supply chain you need yeah. that you need the the empowered uh, and well equipped and well qualified workforce so they're working towards that but there's countries that there's you know countries out there that um have you know not invested in this idea yet and um the professionals are not there to uh, make the strategic uh, decisions that health supply chains need um yeah. yeah definitely a phase approach is uh, is the is the best way to do this um there you know, there's right. there's all kinds of you know short short term supply chain trainings available um right. to upskill there's um you know there's i always say like i just spoke to you about IAPHL I, yeah. it's, it's a great platform where you can connect with other like-minded practitioners and just learn from each other you can fill you know simple gaps that you don't know about like a specific resource or right. a specific technical activity um and learn from your peers that's a great start that's a way to yeah. to phase this as well right um and if there's that real interest then you know move towards uh professional associations and then move to to actually getting those academic degrees and we're seeing more and more of those we have a a resource that we developed back in 2016 together with MIT um and identified um so 39 um master's degree programs in 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 supply chain management on the Af- this was specific for the African continent right, um, right. but that's 2016 we've already seen you know a, a steep increase in the types of programs that are available um take for instance the uh, University of Addis Ababa um also in 2017 started with their master's degree in health supply chain management in their pharma in their school of pharmacy and now we're seeing those cohorts also coming out working at the central level it's really exciting to see that sure sure definitely yeah. uh 
Thank you, Dominic. These, the, the framework itself, you know, evokes so much conversation. I think the, the framework is one of the most important initiatives that people that deliver has brought into the world and uh, really uh, a huge kudos to the entire people that deliver team. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, there's there was many, uh, I, I'm the voice here, but there were many, many different people involved in the development of this. Yeah, yeah, outstanding. Yeah. Um, so you talked earlier about how, you know, the entire world is dependent on two countries for their uh, medical um, supply chain, China and India. They mm. provide either the APIs or they provide the finished products themselves. Right. So countries are starting to look inside, like how can we build the capacity, manufacturing capacity inside? How does the framework allow um, that kind of skill building among people to like, you know, start a manufacturing plant, start in country production of medical supply chains. Because right now, when you talk about supply chain manager in any country, the person needs to have good amount of knowledge on how to import medicines, how to import medical products and commodities, and then get it through customs and then deliver it to health mm -hmm. center. That's right. the basic basic information, that's the basic expertise you need to have if you're a supply chain manager. Five years down the line, the country is going to change where a supply chain manager needs to have knowledge about in-country supply chain. So how does the framework um, help towards that? Or how, how do you see that kind of um, mm -hmm. transition in happening? Yeah, so um, as I said, at the core of the framework is the library of designations and competencies. And those competencies um, cover seven different domains of supply chain management. Um, and it has a brand new um, domain called technology, knowing that um, uh, technology nowadays is, you know, is so incredibly important. Uh, data analysis, data management, uh, you know, decision making with data. Um, so I think these the, the competencies that you're um, um, asking about uh, when it comes to sort of uh, manufacturing capacity locally and how does that implicate, you know, national health supply chains uh, will be able, is all, you know, is found within the, this library of uh, designations and supply chain of uh, designations and um, competencies. Um, and then you can start to really build sort of job descriptions out of those, comp those necessary competencies uh, to develop a specific roles um, and positions that are necessary to support that, um, and then start to align with the the types of skills that need to be trained on. So sure. it's it's a, it's all there. It's very encompassing. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think the the great thing about the framework is that it is it encourages the countries and implementing partners to customize their approach and you know really use that. Yeah opportunity to you know basically listen uh, rather than impose or enforce uh, a structure so that that's really outstanding Dominic. yeah exactly exactly uh, so what is next step for people that deliver and what is next step for the framework um the next step really is um to i start identifying more countries um, that we can support and coach through this process. So like I said, you know, right now we're working with Rwanda. Um, we have um, Nigeria um, set up. We're actually also looking at um, South Africa, but of course COVID, with COVID-19, um, a lot of things have sort of stalled and are, and are slow, yeah. but uh, we're hoping to get South Africa on board in 2022 as well. Um, and then from there, you know, just uh, basically any country that is interested, they can come and, and, and see us, contact myself, the secretary, the people that deliver, uh, and we can put you in touch with uh, the right people to help uh, help you through this process. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, we, have, we have the coaches uh, yeah. to make you understand how the framework can be implemented. 
the uh, the materials that we have on our website, um, you know, slow, uh, you know, very clearly depict yeah. the this uh, racetrack that you need to follow. Of course, each country doesn't need to start at phase one. You could be starting at phase three if you've uh, that advocacy yeah, exactly. has already happened. The country buying has already happened, and everybody's ready to go. So, right. um, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of where we are right now. There's a, a lot of uh, moving pieces. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic, uh, Dominic. In uh, so, how did you become interested in supply chain management? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. yeah, no, that's yeah, great question. Um, so, like I said, uh, um, in, in, it was in two thousand and seven that I joined um, the SEMS project, the supply chain management project. Um, uh, that works on the global HIV AIDS supply chain. And um, it was there that, uh, I, you know, I came in as a, a procurement specialist and I quickly realized uh, how how fascinating supply chain management is to me from end to end. Um, it's, it you know, going from the, the manufacturing uh, these products, these, you know, life-saving products uh, to being able to, to move those through the supply chain to like the most lower level of health facilities that exist. It's a, it's a really exciting um, industry. And, um, and of course, you know, I spent, I spent those years um, looking very much at uh, procurement of the antiretrovirals, um, all the issues that came with it. And it was then as well that I started getting an interest in, in, the, the, that aspect, that element of workforce, sure. and how um, if we don't have the right workforce in place, you know, none of this will will happen. The patients will, uh, the, the products won't reach the patients that really need them, uh, and then you're putting lives at risk. And so, um, when the uh, the position opened up for uh, executive manager, people that's there, I, I just jumped on that because I just thought that was such a perfect sort of next move in my career. Lovely. Lovely, yeah. thank you. And um, you're you're such an inspiration for people in the supply chain field, Dominic. For your uh, you, you know efforts that you've been taking in the workforce arena, and really building that kind of uh, awareness among uh, among uh, the supply chain field to increase uh, and advocate for that um, you know competence within um, uh, within the supply chain field. So thank you for that. And uh, for people who would like to reach out to you, uh, can you share any social media handles you are available on? Yeah, of course. We're uh, on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, people okay. there is on LinkedIn, and we're on Twitter. Um, yeah, so the handle is uh, PPL um, Deliver. Um, oh. Yeah, and we have and we have our websites, and and we also, if you want to reach us directly, you can uh, send us an email at info um, at people that deliver org. So. And I actually made a mistake earlier. It's www.peopledatdeliver.org, not .com. <laughs> oh, okay, no worries. Yep. My, we will, uh, my apologies for that. No problem. We will uh, mm -hmm. uh, we will be posting the uh, link on the description box below. So thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, outstanding conversation, Dominic. Uh, through this conversation, you know, we learned about the uh, people that they were about the framework, about how countries can start with implementing. You don't need to start from the beginning. You can start from even maybe the in a phased approach. The, the framework is basically customizable. But overall, what is important is to professionalize the supply chain workforce, making sure that the um, proper uh, career uh, path is available for supply chain folks in, in any country. And as a result, the countries, the organizations are only making the uh, the supply chain. Um, it, it's, a, it's a major way of mitigating risk within the supply chain, making your supply chain more resilient. Uh, hope I have done a good uh, summary, Dominic. If, yes, is there any last you. points? Oh no! Just wanted to again thank you very much for having me uh, here today and be able to to speak to something that I really love. So thank you for that. Thank you so much once again, and uh, we look forward to having you on the show once again. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll be there. <laughs>
talk on that. Okay. Uh, I think we do have a comment. Oh, we okay. have a comment from Mama Dog. Ah, that's my colleague, Mama, Mama Do. <laughs> okay, outstanding. Oh, Take thank care. you, Mama Do. We have one more from Apollina. Excellent. Thanks. Cool.